to this uh, webinar entitled uh, Your Voices and Actions to Work an Inclusive Post-COVID-19 World, Valuing Differences and Emotional Well-Being. I would like to begin on behalf of UNITAR, the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, and we are based in Geneva, but with colleagues all around the world. Uh, I would like to begin also acknowledging the University of Tokyo and COMEX uh, for their uh, invaluable support to bring this to fruition. And in addition to that, uh, I would like to also acknowledge all the panelists that are um, joining us today, particularly uh, someone that comes with a dual role, a very important one as the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Ecuador, His Excellency Ambassador Luis Gallegos, who is also uh, the Chairman of the Board of Trustees of UNITAL. It's quite an honor for us, and particularly for me as an Ecuadorian as well, uh, to have uh, him, my Chairman and my Minister, uh, co-hosting this event uh, on behalf of UNITAR and his country. And with that, um, I would like to uh, begin, without further ado, with a short presentation to put um, in perspective the COVID pandemic and also uh, then to introduce the rest of the speakers. So with your permission and with your permission, Excellency, I would like to launch the presentation now. Next, please. Very good. Um, we have uh, 216 countries and territories infected as of the 5th of August uh, by the coronavirus um, uh, pandemic. And uh, we are very sad to see that we have started conversations on a second wave of uh, this uh, global health crisis. Next, please. You will see in the numbers ahead that it is unfortunately uh, uh, very sad uh, to see that from uh, March, when we started monitoring this closely to today, next slide please, yes. We went from 169 uh, cases as the, as the 15th of March to almost 19 million cases um, by the second week or the end of the first week of August. And then most important than that, and very sadly so, you see the number of deaths. We went from 6,513 deaths to more than 700,000 deaths in the uh, span of four months or so. Next, please. You will see also in the number of community uh, cases that um, the exponential growth of the coronavirus pandemic has not uh, decreased, unfortunately. And to the right of your screens, you will see that the number of cases reported per day continues to aggressively grow and to be of a magnitude that is worrisome. 207,000 cases above the 5th of August. Next, please. In this slide, that I'm not going to cover in detail because we have short time, you simply have a comparison between the aggressiveness and the death rate of the COVID as compared to other um, uh, lethal viruses. And I, I simply wanted to say that it's not the most lethal, but it is indeed very aggressive. And you see the numbers to the left, it has 1.5 to 2% the reproduction rate uh, compared uh, to the flu. 17% of all cases require uh, oxygen and 5% of the cases are critical or require ventilation. And then the mortality that you see is that all of those cases, 5% uh, of the uh, persons uh, with the coronavirus unfortunately pass away. Next, please. Let me jump from what was a, a global health uh, crisis to what became a social crisis and what has become clearly so, an economic crisis. And here you have a complicated image of what has happened in the main, uh, the most important stock markets around the world in the last um, uh, month or so. Uh, all the stock markets uh, were affected by the virus and breaks, and particularly countries in Asia. And uh, equity markets, uh, however, are slowly rebounding, are still affected, and this is a thermometer of the economy that we wanted to share. Next, please. I had the privilege of being a, um, a governor, an alternate governor to the International Monetary Fund when I worked with Ambassador Gallegos um, in the Ecuadorian government more than a decade ago. And um, I mentioned that in a personal manner because the colleagues that we still have at the International Monetary Fund think that the numbers that I'm going to give you, even though official, are still optimistic. And uh, we have to stick with the official forecast so far but I believe this is to be revised very soon. So the chief economist uh, of the International Monetary Fund, Dr. Jita Gopinath, has said that the great lockdown that we are living through will result, it's already resulting in the world recession since the Great Depression, so a century almost ago, 
uh, we are reliving this thing. And you see the bar to the left, which is red, that uh, proposes that by the end of the year, the real GDP decrease year on year will be minus 3.5% to perhaps uh, minus uh, 4%. And if you compare that to the small bar to the right, you will understand the magnitude of the crisis. Because with all what we remember one decade ago or so, with the global financial crisis, the decrease in the global output, in the global economic output was only 0.1%. Not 1% even, but negative 0.1%. Next. This slide also from the IMS basically tells us that the rebounding will comprise $9 trillion or that 5.8% the economy, the global economy will have to go, to go back to where we were before. Next, please. But, you know, from uh, a global pandemic to a social crisis that we're still living through because of social distance and other things, uh, uh, domestic violence um, has increased. Uh, unfortunately, drug consumption has increased, discrimination has increased, and many things that we are going to uh, debate today uh, from the perspective of disabilities and, and diversity and inclusiveness. But still, next slide please. Um, we uh, want us to uh, give you a positive message because not all is negative. And uh, those are the five R's, the letters R that you have in front of you. We have seen the resolve of the world in dealing with this pandemic. We have the resilience, we have witnessed the resilience of countries to try to go back to a resemblance of normalcy. And we are indeed returning to what would be the new normal uh, with plans uh, for business to return to or normal operations. But however, if there is a second wave, as some people are mentioning and several governments are already under the premise of, uh, parenthesis perhaps, is the Belgian government. The Belgian government, as you know, last week imposed curfews in Brussels and, and around because they are pretty sure that the numbers for the last couple of weeks of uh, infection uh, are showing a resurgence of the virus, at least in that country. But the last two hours to the right, reimagination and reform are very important. And especially if we talk about public policy uh, in a global basis uh, when it comes to disabilities and inclusiveness and discrimination, um, we need to reimagine that next normal in a better way than uh, before. Our Secretary General, and Mr. Guterres has said repeatedly for the last two months, two months and a half, that we must build back better uh, whenever the new normal arrives. And then this is also a good moment to remember that the United Nations uh, claims for reform on regulatory issues uh, to be uh, enacted as soon as possible. Next, please. Here on the diversity, disability and inclusion, um, we are very happy that the University of Tokyo Global Forum on Diversity, Disability and Inclusion um, uh, has been also a partner. It was launched in May 2020 um, and the University of Tokyo COMEX uh, has been part of this thing. So um, we uh, congratulate the leadership that Minister Luis Gallegos has had uh, throughout the years. Um, and uh, has been also a partner in years. It was launched in May 2020. Uh, the University of Tokyo COMEX uh, had moving UNITAR to um, uh, actually focus more so, on the um, we So uh, uh, I did want to call your attention to inaugural sessions that the were held in the this year. And uh, let me lower my volume, thank you. And on June 10, uh, 2020, uh, with a round table and a panel discussion that were important for us and that shows that UNITAR indeed is joining several other uh, global initiatives to promote a better understanding of diversity, disability, and inclusion. Next, please. Now, we are doing this also from the perspective of the next generation. This is why we call it the Young People Roundtable. And I won't be uh, talking uh, uh, too much on that, but uh, this standing forum brings together the voices of young people from the ground as agents of change in addressing the most social global issues. Ambassador Gallegos, Minister Gallegos, I am sure will recognize the importance of the younger generation and younger persons in the issues of disabilities, discrimination and inclusion. Next, please. It's important as well, in addition to give you an overview of how this pandemic is affecting us, to remember 
that the CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, also a product of the leadership of several global statesmen, including Ambassador Gallegos, as chair of the team task force that uh, conceived, drafted, and pushed for the uh, convention uh, to be enacted, approved and enacted, and also ratified by very many countries. Uh, we wanted simply to remember that the CRPD is a valid international multilateral instrument that we must use in order to tackle these issues. And I am not going to read all what you, you have in front of you in the screen, on the screen, but it is important to remember that it's the um, first human rights convention to be open for signature by regional integration organizations and that it entered into force on 3 May 2008, the first comprehensive human rights treaty of the 21st century. Next, please. Youth involvement, it's important for us as a United Nations agency. Uh, we recognize that and wholeheartedly embrace it because young people are at the forefront of risk communication initiatives, spreading correct information and addressing misinformation and pandemic-related discrimination and stigma. Without the concur and the support and the involvement and the ownership of the next generation in this uh, global pandemic, we cannot uh, address it correctly. Examples are the United Nations Secretary General's Envoy of Youth. Uh, you see the hashtag lead the new normal and the hashtag coping with COVID campaigns uh, will uh, uh, shed light on what I'm referring to, but I'm not going to speak uh, her thunder or the representative's uh, uh, speech uh, that will come after. And then you see some other uh, suggestions on Twitter that, and social media that you can visit. Next and last, I believe, um, we will, uh, uh, actually this is the last one, which is good because my time is over, but I do have one last message. And is that um, on behalf of uh, all of us uh, and the uh, CIFAL Global Network of Training Centers of Utah, 21 training centers around the world, we want to uh, reiterate that we are committed to indeed fight uh, whatever, wherever is necessary and engage any actor may, that may be necessary to uh, consider oh, right, uh, post-COVID uh, world where uh, value so, is given, so? where discrimination is real. So we have a UNITAR, the CIFA Global Network, all the directors of the 19 centers that are joining us today, in addition to uh, uh, people in their own countries. I would like to thank you profusely for listening to this introduction and now, and without further ado, invite His Excellency, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Ecuador, Ambassador Luis Gallegos, to take the floor. Excellency. Uh, you are muted, uh, Excellency. Uh, still muted. Let me try to unmute you. Uh, no, you need to unmute yourself. Ambassador, yes, now. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. It's an honor and a pleasure to be with you today and with, uh, uh, as a distinguished moderator. Distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to provide some opening remarks to this important event organized by UNITAR in the University of Tokyo and several United Nations and other academic partners to discuss the role of young persons and, with disabilities amidst the global health crisis. Let me underline that we are connected to the world right now, from Tokyo to Geneva to Ecuador. So we, we, we span the world for this, uh, for this webinar. My gratitude goes to all of you for accompanying us today, to all of our expert panelists whose contributions will provide us with a very rich insight into the issue at hand. At a recent webinar organized uh, with the support of the Secretary General's Envoy for Youth, a young activist from Belgium, Rika Lia, Lavaki provided a powerful statement that is very telling of the situation of all persons with disabilities amidst the current crisis. She explained how, when measures were implemented to try to control the outbreak, the outbreak at stay and stay at home orders were issued, persons with disabilities found themselves better prepared to deal with the quarantine because persons with disabilities are experienced with being confined to their homes and facing isolation and loneliness. Such statements should, ma should make all of us emphasize, empathize with the challenges that all persons with disabilities face every day. Leah's words should open our eyes to the poignant reality that is very difficult for inclusive, accessible, and sustainable societies 
we envision for persons with disabilities. Dear friends, we are facing a global matter that demands our collective efforts. With the overall number of COVID-19 cases about to reach the 20 million mark, health systems all over the world have been put to the test. Most of all, the pandemic has highlighted the vulnerability of certain groups, in particular persons with disabilities, who suffer from constant discrimination and stigma, factors that have been enhanced disproportionately by the current crisis. Disability is not a risk factor for contracting coronavirus, yet persons with disabilities face a higher risk of contagion. They confront the disruption of essential and support systems, and they may meet exacerbated risk situations. Furthermore, within the disability community, specific groups of people have been particularly hit hard, and that is the case of youth and disability. With the closure of educational institutes, such as schools and universities, young persons with disabilities have had to stay home and study and self-study. Online education has made it more challenging for young persons with disabilities due to inaccessible digital content and interfaces. In-person in support decreased or suspended altogether. However, due to the physical distancing measures, assistance in daily activities also decreased, leading to home confinement, heightened isolation and loneliness, which in turn has affected, can affect mental, mental well-being. For these reasons, the government of Ecuador has, permanently, has been permanently active to respond comprehensively to the needs of persons with disabilities. Measures taken have been set out in three lines of actions that include preventive information and care guides for persons with disabilities, cash transfers to their families, and comprehensive well-being measures in areas of health, employment, food security, and education, in particular for young persons with disabilities. At a multilateral level, among the 145 member states, we strongly supported the Secretary General's policy brief, a disability inclusive response for COVID-19 issued in, in early May. The four recommendations outlined by the Secretary General in this document aim to build back better societies that are stronger and more inclusive, accessible and sustainable to all. Dear colleagues, in my current capacity as Minister of Foreign Affairs and, and Human Mobility, Chair of the Unitized Board of Trustees, as well as previous positions as Permanent Representative of Ecuador to the United Nations, President of the Conference of State Parties to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and former chairs of the, of the ADOC Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, I recognize the role of young persons with disabilities in their communities and organizations, and how their active participation can significantly contribute toward the realization of the universal human rights and inclusion of persons with disabilities in the global agenda. In particular, in the face of current humanitarian and economic situation derived from pandemic, young persons with disabilities can play key roles in providing solutions by developing new technologies, platform, and ideas. They can use social media, global networks, and digital communication platforms to amplify empathy and mutual support, as well as to gather data and conduct research in many disability-related issues. The youth can address misinformation and pandemic-related discrimination and stigma and create awareness of the situation of marginalized populations all over the world. During the global health crisis, we must ensure the inclusion and access of all persons with disabilities to health services on an equal basis with others, including medicines, vaccines, and medical equipment, as well as to critical information that is available and accessible for them. However, the meaningful consultation and active participation of all persons with disabilities and their representative organizations in all stages of the COVID-19 response and recovery are an imperative, among many other measures that put persons with disabilities at the center of our efforts. Every crisis can become an opportunity it is up to all of us to make sure that the world will emerge from this pandemic a more equitable and humanistic place and ready to provide that the health emergency can be transformed into an enormous support for social issues and the protection of the promotion of human rights with special emphasis on, on young persons with disabilities. To conclude, I wish all participants a successful event today. We look forward to hearing from our distinguished panels with, about good practices and lessons learned from the pandemic and the recommendations of young persons with disabilities to building back better inclusive and respectful society toward all persons with disabilities who rightfully demand nothing about us without us. Please take care of yourselves and your family. We wish you the best. May God be with you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Alex, uh, my, my best regards to you and all the Unitar team. Thank you very much. Most kind.
Thank you, Excellency. It's been a pleasure uh, to uh, have you with us in this uh, dual capacity, but more important than that, as a champion of the cause of disabilities around the world. Um, with this, um, we are going now to uh, move uh, in the proceedings to the next uh, speaker. And uh, before I do that, I wanted to confirm that we have a Spanish interpretation because I believe we had it at the beginning, that, but then if Julia can check, please, uh, that is uh, continually provided. Let me now uh, introduce um, the United Nations Secretary General's Youth Envoy, Mr. Surya Sahetapi, who is also an advocate, Indonesian deaf advocate, a student of the Rochester, Insti Rochester Institute of Technology and the National Technical Institute for the Deaf, uh, and uh, also a student of international, uh, the international faculty there. So without further ado, uh, allow me to give you the floor, Mr. Saheta. Are you with us? I appreciate uh, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I would like to talk about two different perspectives on disability. One, we often think of deafness in particular as a physical disability, people who can't hear, but it can also be an environmental disability. And so my own perspective is gonna focus on the ways deafness is an environmental disability that is often not supported. To be supported means people would understand what our needs are. And so I'll talk about some of those needs. For example, I intended a meeting where all the participants used Indonesian sign language. There was one person who came to the meeting though who did not use Indonesian sign language. And so that person needed the services of a sign language interpreter. Even though that person was hearing, in that environment, that was the person who had the disability. They needed interpretation services to understand the deaf participants. So that's why I refer to deafness as an environmental disability. The barriers are communication. Now, I myself have ex experienced bullying and stigma due to my disability. I wonder how many people in the world have exposed themselves to people with disabilities. When you contribute your time and volunteering activities, are you doing that with a thought to people who have disabilities as well? We should look for ways to expose ourselves to other communities. So if there are exchange students, consider exchange students who have disabilities. Or if you have any kinds of activities, include people with disabilities and consider what their access needs are. Often disabled people understand what their access needs are in any particular situation. This event is important to help us all understand um, what accessibility needs are, how we can provide those needs, and often it's just a case of simple education to help people know how they can provide support. One way of providing support relates to mental health, and that certainly is an issue now, but even before COVID, disabled people were often lacking access to basic information about mental health itself, let alone accessibility accommodations like interpreters. And now with masks, deaf people often can't see and understand as easily as they might have otherwise. As I said, even before COVID, uh, students in Indonesia where I connect, where I have found some studies said that a high percentage of students didn't have access to education at the universities. And certainly as universities have switched to remote learning, that percentage has increased with the challenges of connectivity and access in, in remote learning as well. Just connecting to people is difficult. In my home country, um, I have some data to help clarify some of these kinds of concepts. We know that the World Federation of the Deaf, WFD, has said that there are 32 million deaf children in the world. And roughly 80% of those children have no access to education at all. Of those children, those who do have access to education, only 1% to 2% have access to that education provided in sign language. That's a very small number. This kinds of data sets are very important to us. 
Across organizations that want to work together, there have been surveys. Now, these were not conducted by uh, the governments, but surveys that show that 80% of people have been impacted by the challenges that COVID has caused in terms of education to, uh, rather access to education. So disabled and non-disabled organizations need to work together to look at providing access to the internet, not only for education, but certainly for education as well as medical services as well for disabled people. So uh, I'm hopeful, as we've already heard, that some of the changes that we can devise will make a difference going forward. But remember, deafness is not just a physical disability, but one of access to information. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, a very uh, good reminder and, and a very good message. Uh, and I appreciate uh, the job that you just did, very holistic. Um, and let's uh, continue with the proceedings. And let me now uh, invite Ms. Enrica Sugata, the representative of the University of Tokyo, UNITE, to take the floor. Ms. Sugata. Um, thank you very much for your kind introduction, as well as your excellencies, UNITER, co-organizers, and many participants all across the world. Um, it is a great honor for me to represent young people in the University of Tokyo and partners, so as to make opening remarks on such an important occasion today. Um, we're engaging in various activities related to the sustainable development goals through arts and culture in collaboration with the UN agencies and many other partners. Um, in Empowered Project, we're promoting Magenta Star Batch in order to encourage anyone to show their willingness to support others. We are also offering an online platform called the Voices of Youth Japan where every youth all over Japan can exchange ideas, understand different perspectives, and connect with each other. Um, my dream has always been achieving the world where no one would be left behind and where everyone could naturally appreciate diversity. However, I do not truly believe in myself because I am just a young girl. Um, I did not really know what kind of actions I could take because I've of, um, because I have some differences compared to so-called ordinary people. Since I started being involved in these projects, my feeling has greatly changed. I have learned that diversity is not something special, but something naturally perceived to be valuable in our organization. No matter where we are from, how we look like, whether we have any disability, each categorization is just one side of ourselves, and it does not determine who we are. Wearing our Magenta Star Badge, we all are able to re respond to individual needs whenever we are willing to do so. <laughs> we all are able to ask for support whenever we need any. Furthermore, regardless of the volume of our voices or our ages, each and every one of our opinions is valuable enough to be carefully heard. Through our online platform, we can encourage youth, including those who are among the silent majority and the silent minority, to express their true feelings that may easily go unheard. So all our activities originally started with small voices, hopes, and new ideas of youth, though, celebrities, private sector and academia have gradually gathered together to make our initiatives widely known. Yes, I understand that I am one of the lucky ones, but I would like to emphasize that small voices and actions can be big enough. Each of them can be a key to promoting inclusion and equality among everyone beyond our differences. Um, currently, we are facing uncertain times under the influence of COVID-19 pandemic, and this crisis makes it more apparent that there are still large numbers of people who are marginalized. 
We have also seen that online communication may have many possibilities as well as limitations. But in such a situation particularly, I think that we realize the importance of supporting one another rather than fighting against each other. So it is a great pleasure to welcome young people with many different backgrounds from many different countries here today. I hope that this forum will provide the keys to building back better toward the post-COVID-19 world. Dear everyone, let us share our voices, hopes, and perspectives. Let us cooperate with each other beyond our differences. And together, let us take a significant step toward a more inclusive world where every difference is naturally and truly valued. Thank you very much. Thanks uh, to you, uh, indeed. Uh, I believe all the uh, panelists so far has given an excellent overview of where we should be looking at, where our, our focus should be. And so uh, we have some ideas of what to do next. So I uh, thank you. And now we will go to the formal proceedings in terms of a more structural content with two components. The first one, the section one, uh, is entitled Intersectionally, Intersectionally among gen Amongst Gender, Culture, Disability, and Youth. And section two, that will be uh, hosted and moderated by my colleague Julia Genf, uh, is entitled Ongoing Youth Initiatives and Innovative Ideas for Inclusive Post-COVID-19 World. It's a more practical uh, view, perhaps. But to continue with the agenda, allow me now to have the pleasure of introducing Ms. Leila Sharafi, Senior Gender Advisor at the United Nations Population Fund. Uh, to our colleague Leila, welcome again. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Really, it's a pleasure and honor to be speaking with you today. Thank you for the invitation. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone uh, in different parts of the world. My name is Leila Sharafi, and I am the gender advisor, but I also work on issues related to youth as well as disability and uh, leaving no one behind. Through my presentation today, I'd like to show the intersectionality between gender, culture, disability, and young people. I will talk about some of the work of UNFPA uh, in terms of supporting and engaging young people in COVID response and recovery, including young persons with disabilities, but very importantly, talk about how young people themselves are agents of change during this time. Next slide, please. So, firstly, I'd like to talk about a few things we've done to ensure that all young people still receive their life-saving services and are able to exercise their rights, uh, while also very much encouraging young people to be involved. For us, of course, as the UN Population Fund, what's essential is that sexual and reproductive health and rights information education and services are not interrupted during COVID. And we know that these are some of the issues that get sidelined during such, such a public health emergency. We also strove really hard to make sure that factual age appropriate information about the virus and concrete instructions about how to prevent its spread was disseminated. We also work to support young people in risk communication, virtual community engagement, and of course, how to engage safely if they're working on behalf of organizations or also just as advocates or individuals within their communities, which in many ways, so many of them already are. This next point is actually very important. We wanted to also ensure that measures to prevent and protect against violence, stigma, and discrimination against young people, especially women and girls, uh, particularly those from marginalized communities and groups, are there. We know that violence has spiked tremendously during COVID-19, and unfortunately, crises such as this really exacerbate the problem. And finally, we wanted to 
not reinvent the wheel, but build on existing initiatives aimed at leaving no one behind, including our We Decide initiative, which is a program that we started four years ago to promote the rights of young persons with disabilities so that they can exercise their reproductive rights, still have access to sexual and reproductive health services, and be free of violence. Next slide, please. We also developed technical briefs based on our adolescent and youth strategy. And these are really aimed at providing practical guidance for ensuring that the programming for all young people continues. Uh, these eight briefs touch on many different issues and can really be used as a package or on their own. Uh, one of the areas which is critical for us and for young people is access to comprehensive sexuality education. So what we did was we made sure that in this guidance we talked about the importance of following local policies around phys physical distancing, small training groups outdoors with, with uh, adequate PPE, personal protective equipment for the trainers, for uh, any, any peer educator involved in delivering CSE, Comprehensive Sexuality Education. Uh, but we tried to make sure that it was inclusive. For example, procuring clear face masks for trainers and peer educators uh, for um, young people who are being trained that are hearing impaired or deaf so that they could see um, the mouths of the trainers. Um, we also really tried to ensure that digital technologies and innovation, including in Ethiopia, Iran, Kazakhstan, were used to the extent possible to deliver CSE in the absence of um, or significantly reduced face-to-face -face CSE. Online, you can also find many materials that we've produced, including on promoting the rights of persons with disabilities during COVID-19. We developed some key messages as well as a video and other materials from the country level have, have also been developed around COVID. Next slide, please. So for International Youth Day, we launched a Youth Day Challenge under the hashtag Youth Against COVID-19 to hear from young people about how they're coping with COVID-19 uh, and how, most importantly, we think that young people will influence the new normal because they are influencing and shaping the new normal. So we partnered with Prezi, the platform, as well as Scouts and other partners. And in the end, uh, this global campaign produced at least 100 videos in 20 languages reaching over half a million users. And what's really important is that we, we went the extra mile to ensure that the campaign uh, could engage all youth. So that includes Afro-descendant young people, indigenous youth, and youth with disabilities. Next slide, please. So very quickly, I would just like to share some examples of how young people are contributing themselves to COVID response, which is really important to show that they are contributors and agents of change. They're also laying the groundwork for recovery and for the future and building back better, which we so often hear about now. So we convened surveys directly with young people to hear from them, and this provided great insights into the challenges they face and also what they need. So in the Pacific, throughout East and Southern Africa, and many other countries, young people provided key insights on COVID realities. In Jordan, in the Zatari refugee camp, the youth-led task force, which was supported by UNFPA and partners, provided peer support groups during COVID-19. Now, this is something they've done uh, during pre-COVID, but it became even more important during COVID-19. In Guatemala, for example, inspired by the global campaign I just talked about, young people recorded one-minute videos of themselves on their cell phones. Um, and what we know and what we see now from there is that a diversity of young people are promoting the campaign through social media, particularly indigenous community, uh, youth, and young people with disabilities. In Indonesia, um, uh, through some support uh, with partners and through UNFPA, youth have been engaging through social media, including on the importance of mental health, which we know is so critical uh, and is so neglected and has become uh, very clear during COVID that it is an essential part of uh, the health and overall well-being of, of, of everyone, including young people. And another example of accessibility, just one example, uh, in, in Vietnam, young people created a 
COVID awareness video early on uh, when COVID was first uh, introduced, unfortunately, to the world in sign language so that the messages were accessible to, to young people who are deaf. Next slide, please. This is just an example from our Fiji survey. Uh, I talked about the global survey earlier, uh, and it's just a snapshot just to show you some of the information that we receive from young people, and it's just so valuable. And you can see here that youth really show the way. 95% uh, of the respondents said that they are taking precautions to stay infection-free and healthy, and they go the extra mile. 65% of them said that they are providing information to friends and family, and for 43% said, look, we're committed to preventing stigma. We also know that they're not a homogenous group. We know young people um, live in all their diversity. Uh, so that's what some of the data here showed. 40% say that they're more vulnerable due to age, 33% due to their gender. Um, but they also pointed out some things, for example, again, at least a third, uh, I would imagine actually it's even more in reality, reported that men mental health and psychosocial support were either not available uh, or people did not know about them. So you can see how um, this, is, this would be really valuable information to know. Next slide, please. Again, this is another uh, slide from the Fiji survey, but I just wanted to point out that first line, which says 57%, uh, this is a positive, reported more communication and cooperation within their communities, which is something we're seeing, right, in our own communities, that people are coming together to, to, to fight this crisis. But unfortunately, 51% of them said they also saw an, saw an increase in domestic violence and abuse, which I talked talked about earlier. And again, they talk about how they really, really uh, need mental health and psychosocial support during this time. Next slide, please. So what are some lessons for building back better? Well, we know that young people are valuable resources in reaching their peers, especially when they are hard to reach. Now, um, the young people themselves have always been excellent teachers and resources for other peers. And this stands true during the pandemic. They also know wh who the other youth are in their communities, especially if they are uh, from historically excluded populations and groups, right? Including young people with disabilities, but also LGBTI youth, um, youth that are um, uh, in indigenous communities, et cetera. Um, by engaging marginalized youth, right, youth who face discrimination, stigma, they're empowered as agents of change. And this is so important. As they bring their knowledge, as they bring uh, what works best for them, uh, it, we see human rights principle of participation coming to life, but we see their confidence build, we see their self-esteem build, and we see most importantly them, and they see themselves as contributors to fighting this COVID, but also any other crises and for building back better. Uh, this next point is really important, and it's something we've learned and I've learned in my work, that engaging youth from all backgrounds is essential and has to become normalized. Uh, and this takes planning and this takes partnerships, which is actually one of the next bullets. Um, it, takes, it takes time to ensure that we have the right accessible um, tools in place for if you're doing Zoom sessions like this one, ensuring that you have uh, accessible materials ahead of time, sign language, Language. It takes time and it takes planning, but it is something that has to become normalized in everything we do. We must pay attention to mental health and emotional well-being, as I said before. It's something that has not gotten enough attention, but I hope with this crisis, it's actually brought it to the, to the surface, that it's something we cannot ignore. And finally, young people are willing and ready to play the transformative role. And that's something we saw when we did our surveys. We saw that there was a willingness to respond on to the surveys and we saw that they really were full of energy, full of uh, wanting to help and are ready to really change things. Next slide, please. 
This is my final slide. So what kinds of actions are required uh, and, and to help realize the building back better? Well, first and foremost, we have to invest in building human capital and uh, making sure that young people have access to uh, education, gainful employment and decent work in the future, and really thinking about their empowerment as, a, as an overall um, uh, objective. And, and in UNFPA, we talk about taking uh, advantage of this demographic dividend, right? Investing in this large group of young people um, and you can really see the returns for your society and your country. Um, we have to bring all young people to the decision-making table and I emphasize all um, in all their diversity um, and ensure that those who face again multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination they have to be leaders if they want to and they have to be involved and this can't be understated enough. Um, supporting young people with resources, mentoring, and opportunities. Uh, I think that there is really uh, a lot of organizations out there, but if they don't have the resources, if they don't have the mentoring, including through intergenerational support and opportunities, uh, they'll, their work and their advocacy uh, will continue to be challenged. And finally, we have to enable more cross collaboration with other social justice movements. Uh, together we can do more. For example, disability movement with the youth movement, with uh, those promoting the rights of indigenous communities, with the women's movement, I think, um, you know, racial justice movement. These are all different uh, efforts that are really trying to improve the human condition and have a better uh, uh, outcome for, for all human beings and I think the more and we've learned this through our work the more we bring together different partnerships and movements uh, the stronger we are together next slide please I would just really like to thank you again for inviting me and for your attention and uh, I'd like to point out that this beautiful artwork here from my last slide comes from our office in the Pacific uh, and um, talks about the importance of supporting all young people so thank you so much uh, thank you, Ms. Sharafi. A uh, beautiful presentation indeed. And thank you for uh, several reminders, but one of them on the importance of investing in young people through capacity building and other means. Um, this takes care of uh, section one. The title was Intersectionally Among Gender, Cultural Disability, and Youth. Now we will move the proceedings to section two, entitled Ongoing Youth Initiatives and Innovative Ideas for inclusive post-COVID-19 world. We have an impressive array, array of seven speakers uh, with a very important uh, representative in terms of geography and gender and disciplines, but all of them with a common factor, which is to be voices of youth uh, that can guide us on how to do things better and to build back better. This section two will be uh, moderated as announced by my colleague, Ms. Julia Genth, also here in Geneva, and uh, Julia should take the floor now. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Alex. Um, next slide, please. Next, we have two very impressive agents of change from Bolivia. You have to unmute. Um, part of the Latinx Indigenous. Afro Boliviano in Santa Cruz. And for anybody um, who would like to hear this presentation in English, please go to the interpretation button and switch to English. Many thanks. And I leave the floor to Ms. Tabita Mendes and Mr. Avalo Churi Churi. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Adelante. Perfecto, estamos escuchando, adelante. Buenos días. Sí. Mi nombre es Tabita Méndez Flores. Eh, pertenezco a, a los pueblos indígenas. Yo soy guaraní y represento a la Organización de Jóvenes Indígenas y Afrobolivianos de Santa Cruz de la Sierra, Bolivia. Buenos días, mi nombre es Álvaro Chávez. 
¿Eh? Soy joven indígena chiquitano moncor de la nación indígena, de las naciones indígenas eh, representando a Bolivia. Eh, la siguiente presentación, por favor. Eh, para la contextualización del problema que nosotros perseguimos a través de la organización, eh, la incidencia política, social y económica, eh, nos basamos en el contraste de, la, de nuestro eh, departamento eh, residente del cual nosotros provenimos y la organización es, se enfoca, por la cual la organización se, se enfoca para la incidencia. Entonces, la urbe cruceña es una ciudad de contraste para nosotros, puesto que también nos muestra una ciudad en desarrollo, como también eh, el, la otra cara de la moneda, que es una ciudad excluyente, eh, socialmente hablando, pobre, y ya que en el departamento de Santa Cruz eh, se, se considera el motor económico, pero predomina también la economía informal. El 30% de esta población vive en condiciones de pobreza y el 61% eh, de, eh, de esta población son indígenas que viven en los centros urbanos, ya sea por población indígena eh, migrante o no migrante, puesto que las ciudades han, han, han alcanzado los territorios indígenas. En las ciudades de, de Santa Cruz de la Sierra también eh, cuenta con más de 1,5 millones de habitantes y la mitad de estos son inmigrantes. Posteriormente, el 35% de la población de los siete pueblos indígenas y afrobolivianos somos jóvenes en los 15 a 29 años de edad. Siguiente, por favor. Las problemáticas que enfrentamos la juventud indígena y afroboliviana en el área urbana cada vez más se está agudizando, ya que la formación de parejas a temprana edad y los embarazos adolescentes, las cifras siguen aumentando. Todavía nosotros vivimos en una cultura muy machista, donde hay mucha violencia de género y donde hay poca apertura y, y poco respeto hacia la diversidad sexual y de género. Sufrimos muchos prejuicios y discriminación por nuestro origen cultural, por nuestro idioma, hasta incluso por nuestros apellidos. Tenemos muy poco acceso a la educación secundaria, técnica y universitaria. Y lamentablemente a la hora de buscar oportunidades laborales, esto nos afecta, ya que con, como no cumplimos con los requisitos, muchas veces optamos por empleos informales y precarios. Eh, también vivimos en, en viviendas en alquiler y las pocas personas que tienen viviendas propias este, no tienen derecho propietario y eso hace que puedan ser desalojados en cualquier momento. En cuanto a la participación de las organizaciones indígenas, es muy reciente porque antes nos decían que nosotros no podíamos ser parte de la organización porque éramos jóvenes y porque no teníamos la, ex, la experiencia suficiente. Siguiente. A raíz de todo, la anterior, por favor. A raíz de todos estos problemas, eh, surge la organización de jóvenes indígenas y afrobolivianos de Santa Cruz de la Sierra la cual es una organización de activistas jóvenes que nos autoidentificamos, eh, ya que fuera de las organizaciones, en muchos de estos casos, esto está mal visto. Entonces, nos autoidentificamos como jóvenes indígenas y afrobolivianos eh, del departamento eh, de nuestro municipio, representando nuestros objetivos que son eh, defender los derechos económicos, sociales y culturales de jóvenes indígenas y afrobolivianos en el municipio mediante el activismo y la incidencia social, cultural, política. Siguiente, por favor. Los ejes de acción que tenemos como población joven indígena y afrobolivianos es que nosotros nos visibilizamos como jóvenes indígenas afrobolivianos urbanos. También este, apostamos a rescatar, a rescatar y fortalecer nuestra identidad cultural, porque todo parte primero de nosotros, conocer nuestros orígenes, conocer nuestras, nuestras historias, y a través de eso también este, aportar y hacer presentaciones culturales eh, 
por nuestras danzas que son muy representativas de cada cultura. También nos formamos en derecho, en participación, en derechos de salud sexual y reproductivo. Hacemos incidencia, hacemos activismo y estamos en constante relacionamiento con otras organizaciones indígenas y no indígenas, ya que esto hace de que todos debemos velar por nuestros derechos como jóvenes en la ciudad. Siguiente. Entre muchas actividades que también hemos realizado están este, reconocimientos, eh, foros eh, nacionales, internacionales que hemos realizado para la visibilización eh, y lograr los objetivos de la Organización de Jóvenes Indígenas y Afro, Afrobolivianos. Gracias a esto también hemos sido eh, reconocidos como defensores de derechos humanos eh, porque hemos trabajado en el activismo y la incidencia social, política y económica desde el año 2015 con la creación y el incentivo de solamente cuatro jóvenes indígenas que conformábamos. Actualmente ya somos eh, más de 50 y seguimos creciendo. Eh, también eh, hemos creado eh, la Agenda de, Juven de la Juventud Indígena y Afroboliviana de Santa Cruz de la Sierra. Eh, esto expresando y a través de, de análisis empírico y la, la, la captación de, de muchos jóvenes indígenas, las, las problemáticas que viven eh, gracias a las condiciones generadas al ser migrante, de la zona rural hacia las zonas urbanas. Eh, estos en foros llamados entre la ancestralidad y la modernidad. Eh, actualmente también este, a, eh, impulsamos campañas de salud sexual y salud reproductiva. Nosotros la denominamos a estas campañas Miki Miki, eh, que van por los derechos eh, sexuales y reproductivos de los jóvenes, pero específicamente de los jóvenes indígenas y afrobolivianos. Eh, actualmente también estamos llevando a cabo foros eh, de la juventud indígena y afroboliviana frente a la crisis sanitaria y al contexto político que estamos viviendo, puesto que estamos en etapa electoral en nuestro país boliviano y en el cual nosotros también podemos eh, tener eh, al alcance de nuestra mano eh, a, los, a los que están postulando como autoridades de poder eh, dentro de nuestro país para conocer las eh, las políticas y lineamientos que estos tienen y poder recomendar también eh, las, recomendar las políticas públicas dirigidas hacia los jóvenes y población indígena, eh, hacia las minorías poblacionales. Siguiente, por favor. Ah, entre las recomendaciones que nosotros damos a... Ah, a nuestro país a través de, de, este, de este webinar internacional. Eh, recomendamos que los, que los tres niveles de gobierno garanticen los ej ejercicios de los derechos de los pueblos indígenas reconocidos constitucionalmente desde el 2009, año en que se aprueba nuestra nueva Constitución Política del Estado y reconoce a Bolivia un Estado plurinacional, diverso y complejo para toda la sociedad. Una, una, un país que incluye no solamente en el nombramiento, sino también el reconocimiento de los derechos de los pueblos indígenas y las diversidades. Eh, recomendamos también que la legislación boliviana reconozca la territorialidad y los derechos de los pueblos indígenas y el pueblo afroboliviano en los centros urbanos, puesto que es, todas las legislaciones en nuestro país boliviano están re, netamente centradas en la territorialidad y y en la territorialidad, y estos no comprenden que los pueblos indígenas también están en las zonas urbanas y que están en gran cantidad poblacional. Recomendamos eh, que las políticas y programas nacionales y locales referidas a juventud incorporen acciones específicas para la población indígena y afroboliviano y que ésta no solo sea de forma enunciativa, Puesto que para los diagnósticos de las políticas públicas y de las leyes sí se mencionan a los pueblos indígenas, pero posteriormente para un plan, para una ejecución de un programa, un proyecto eh, y la elaboración de, 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 de alguna ejecución de, de alguna política pública no se nos contempla. Y, y, 
y eso es lo que estamos recomendando. También recomendamos que las organizaciones indígenas que nuestras organizaciones matrices promuevan una mayor participación y cobertura a las demandas de las mujeres, los jóvenes y diversidades sexuales y de género, ya que por el momento este, no hay mucha participación. Eh, también que las medidas gubernamentales adoptadas por la emergencia sanitaria no restrinjan los derechos ni postreen la atención de las agendas y demandas de los jóvenes indígenas y afrobolivianos. También recomendamos a los jóvenes y a otras organizaciones indígenas y afrobolivianos que tenemos que seguir gestionando mecanismos de incidencias creativas para seguir impulsando nuestras agendas, ya que por el momento, como estamos en emergencia sanitaria, pero tenemos esa capacidad de seguir incidiendo con otras herramientas, ya sea tecnológicas, para seguir velando por nuestros derechos. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, gracias a toda la comunidad internacional por darnos la oportunidad de eh, poder hacer conocer nuestras eh, iniciativas, actividades y a la organización como tal que vela por los derechos de los pueblos indígenas eh, en esta pequeña región del Estado Plurinacional de Bolivia. Buenos días, buenas tardes. Thank you very much. Um, for those um, very informative and very good um, presentations. Um, we have indeed learned a lot. Um, thank you for people in our And um, I'm sure um, our participants have enjoyed it as well. Um, up next, we have uh, Mr. Omar Didi, who's the president of Mag Jeune um, from France. And um, yes, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Didi. Uh, well, thank you so much for uh, for the invitation and uh, for providing the chance to be here. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to share the floor with other uh, young people in order to um, to present our different initiatives and uh, to bring forward our ideas. Um, I think the, f the, f the first thing that we need to highlight here in terms of LG in, in terms of the LGBT uh, community and LGBT youth is that is that it's already in mar a really marginalized group. Um, if I take the last it's that we did with UNESCO, it was the first uh, global consultation on LGBTI youth inclusion in education and in terms of access to health, where we had more than 20, uh, 23,000 respondents from all over the world. Uh, we saw that one out of two LGBTI youth has, has experienced harassment in school in 2018. Um, one out of two young people cannot envision their future in their own country. And uh, another very striking and very dramatic uh, finding in uh, the consultation was that nine out of 10 LGBTI youth didn't feel that they were included in policy making by, uh, by their country's representatives. So that was the case already in 2018. And as we saw with the global pandemic, uh, we have unprecedented, unprecedented challenges uh, in terms uh, that shows us our human resilience as, as much as threatens the world economical order. And the LGBTI community has been uh, hit, uh, is one of the most uh, hit community uh, in the entire, um, in the entire communities, let's say. So firstly, uh, what we experienced firsthand is, um, in terms of LGBTI youth is the violence and the domestic violence that LGBTI youth can face, especially if confined in their house and ho in a hostile environment, maybe from their friends, their neighbors, and especially their families. And uh, we needed to ensure that there was a response so that housing was provided to LGBTI youth who would be experiencing violence. Um, we were, we were actually quite lucky because in, in, in the time of the confinement, uh, Le Défenseur des Droits, so the rights defender in France published a report that showed that LGBTI youth were the first uh, community that was uh, hit in terms of domestic violence. So we had the numbers and uh, we launched with, uh, in partnership with the government, uh, an initiative in order actually to house LGBTI youth uh, and to provide proper care um, during the pandemic and, and after. Um, the, I, I mean, of course, there's, there's this part about uh, domestic violence. There's also uh, other uh, 
problematics that the LGBTI community faced during uh, during this pandemic. Um, mostly in um, the more a country would criminalize same-sex marriage or would um, would actually fight against the trans community taking it as a scapegoat uh, in society. Uh, we saw, um, yeah, um, we saw that uh, in 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 many countries uh, the LGBTI community was even more marginalized. And uh, Outright Action International, for instance launched a global fund in order to um, provide help to the LGBTI community worldwide, especially that we were seeing that there was a lack of funding. Um, as we know, the LGBTI people are more likely to be unemployed and to live in poverty than the general population. And many of the LGBTI community work in the informal sector and lack access to paid sick leave and employment comp compensation and coverage. Um, hence why a lot of the LGBTI community and actually even in France, needed to um, have access to food support and to food shelter. So um, do, this is, in, I mean, in terms, in terms of the presentation, this is some of the facts before the global pandemic and what's hap when, what happened during the pandemic. Uh, I can't go into all of the details of what happened to the LGBT community. But in terms of the future and uh, what should we do in the future, uh, as as a community and as a global community, the first thing is actually to listen to to the youth, uh, to listen to the most marginalized youth. It is it might be striking and shocking actually to hear that of the first global consultation that was ever done in terms of LGBTI youth was done in 2018. One would think that um, these that we need this data and we would have focused on getting this data way before. And on a global level, this was the first time that we were um, hearing LGBTI youth and that we were considering them in terms of their own view on what inclusive education is and on what um, access to health is to them and what we can provide to the LGBTI youth community. So the first thing is obviously to listen uh, to, to those who are concerned. Uh, the second thing is to include, obviously, the LGBTI youth in all level of policy dialogue. So when I say all level, I, I mean the municipalities uh, at a national level, at a regional, and of course, at an international level. This brings me to a third point, which is, on, uh, which is essential, is basically to support uh, the youth organizations. Um, as, as we can see, we don't actually have an international LGBTI youth network. Um, and we are working with, uh, with UNESCO and uh, with France, with Canada, the, ne the Netherlands and Austria in order to launch an international LGBTI youth network. Um, it would be done uh, on a global conference on the 17th of May. Um, so this is uh, one, one, one of the things that we can do is just to support these types of initiatives in order to bring the voices um, of youth and if you want to have the voices of youth, they can't be individual. They need to be collective and they need to be constru constructed collectively. So supporting youth organization is, um, is quite essential. Another point that I would like to make is obviously cross-sectoral cooperation. And um, it's basically going out of our silo type of work and to partner with all types of organizations May, um, I mean, for us as an LGBT structure, it's not just to partner with LGBT organizations, it's also to partner with women rights organizations, for instance, and to have, uh, in terms of our lobbying and in terms of our voices, the voices of all of the rest and to amplify them in order to, to basically just work all together and, um, never to, and to leave no one behind. Obviously, there are uh, other other perspective and other ideas, uh, but I will finish uh, everything I have to say here. And again, thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Didi, for your presentation and for the uh, wonderful talk you gave. Um, it was very informative and um, now, I'm about to please present the next panelist. Um, 
It was Miss Marvella, Esther Cunha She was um, a student at the University of Melbourne, the University of Indonesia. Um, she will not be participating live with us, but she has sent us a video recording of a presentation, uh, which we'll be showing you. Thank you. There is no sound. I was feeling sad when the selfishness of individuals started and University of Melbourne, a former student who is taking a double degree. Hi everyone, I am Marvella Aster, a former student who is taking a double degree partnership program between University of Indonesia and University of Melbourne, and thus I am now living and studying in the city of Melbourne, Australia. When I arrived in Melbourne after my 29th in December break, I thought I would have so much fun traveling around this foreign country. But then all of those plans had to be canceled, specifically starting on 21st of March when the Melbourne government officially imposed a lockdown due to COVID-19. I was feeling sad when the selfishness of individuals started to become apparent during the crisis. I saw that here, people went crazy over household essentials, leaving none left to others. There were also devastating news about two men involved in physical fighting just because one of them tried to stockpile formula milk and an international student got mocked by a stranger in the street based on a false perception as if a particular nationality or ethnicity is highly correlated with the virus. I was also sad that the crisis brought what I believe is one of the most unwanted feelings. It is loss. Many have lost their jobs. Many have lost their loved ones. I have a close friend who lost her part-time job. Me personally, lost my chance to go to an overseas summer program that I had carefully planned from last year, just like that. Although at first I, and some other people as well I believe, felt frustrated, my devastated feeling has gradually been changing. Now I feel that this feeling of loss has made me learn that losing is not the end of everything. I am grateful that in fact from this loss, from experiencing this COVID-19 crisis, I have learned several things that I am sure I will never pay any attention to if this COVID-19 doesn't come. I believe that those points must continue to be maintained when COVID-19 ends. Three things that I would like to highlight today that I believe are fundamentally needed to make a better world. I believe a better world would be firstly, when we care more about our Earth. The global air pollution decreased since lockdown in many regions, and in Jakarta, Indonesia specifically, the air quality improved during the period of large-scale social restriction. This fact makes us realize that all this time, we were very selfish, only thinking about our own interests. Many just want the practicality of using private cars to be mobile, not giving any chance to use public transportation or other greener alternatives when being green is not seen as an obligation to them. This fact enlightens us that the earth is crying for the need to be protected. Starting small would still be appreciated. Simply minimize our plastic and energy use. Just do our best for our earth because we belong to the earth as well. To support this, I also particularly hope that the policymakers can ensure that the public transportation is safe and comfortable, that it encourages more people to use it, as well as guaranteeing that there is a safe pathway for pedestrians, cyclists, and disabled. 
Secondly, I also believe that a better world is when we value relationships and diversity in community even more. This pandemic makes us realize that indeed, all human beings are born equal. We all can feel what is happy, we all can feel what is sad, and we all can be affected by any virus. The virus does not see our ethnicity, our races, our gender, our age. Basically, it doesn't discriminate. It also becomes clear that we do need each other and as such, shouldn't look at other people higher or lower than us. I am personally thankful for the public cleaning staff that they make sure the places we visit are hygiene and safe for us. For the cashiers in my local supermarket who make sure we can still access living supplies, especially during quarantine. For the delivery services who sacrifice for us when it feels unsafe to go out. For the medical staff who directly fight the virus. And to other unsung heroes out there. I also personally feel that by this pandemic, we become more enlightened that mental health issues do exist. Anxiety is a real thing. It's definitely not an attention seeker, and we do need to talk about it. During my lockdown here in Melbourne, I did experience the feeling of being lonely, and I admit it doesn't feel good. I need my friends, family, basically other caring people who can listen to me without any judgment. I am grateful for the investment in the technology that make borderless communication possible, although I also believe that face-to-face -face interaction will still always be valuable. As such, I hope that the policymakers, other young people, parents, and all individuals in the society to be more empathetic, truly understand and support the focality of issue of mental health. As highly important as mental health, our physical health as citizens should also be reinforced. Let's make an environment, community, and self-awareness that promotes healthy living so that we don't take our ability to breathe freely for granted. Lastly, I believe a better world would be when everyone tries their best to do philanthropic actions because there's nothing to lose from sharing what we have to others. Here in Melbourne, there is an international student who shares his creativity to open a social media platform that helps advertise small businesses to connect with buyers for free during this time of economic difficulty. Youth here volunteer to provide free meals as a food relief measure to those in need. In Indonesia, university students held an online concert to raise charity fund. A youth gathers his friends to create an online media platform that is aimed to raise awareness on racism and mental health issues because he believes staying at home doesn't mean he cannot do something impactful. A youth uses her added skill to create a database of unemployed home cleaning service workers to connect them to potential buyers. A youth starts to donate proceeds from her painting commissions for aiding COVID-19 medical measures. A youth tries to find a way to employ the unskilled workers to help recycle unused cotton clothes into more affordable face masks that help poor children to be safer when they need to go to school later. A youth, me and you, may not be able to change the whole world, but we can change someone's life. Dear everyone, yes, to the fact that this crisis we are experiencing has created unbelievable losses, but also yes, to the fact that this crisis has made us feel beyond grateful. We are grateful that this crisis has opened our eyes to matters that are significant for me, you, and everyone to embrace and fight for in order to actualize our definition of a stronger, more loving, and better world. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hello, and thank you very much. Um, that was a very wonderful video, and um, it was indeed very remarkable, and we are very glad um, that uh, the panelist was able to give her comments um, via this video. Up next, we have Mr. Yusuke Ayuama. He is a student at the University of Tokyo, a member of the Empower Project, and a part of the Voices of Youth in Japan. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Person, co-organizers, and distinguished fellow panelists and participants. My name is Yosuke Aoyama, the Chief of the Administration Department of the Voices of Yoshipan and a member of the Empire Project. Today, I would like to talk about activities in Japan and some action point for the building back our world better. The first slide, please. In Japan, the number of youth is drastically decreasing. The number of youth is about 2.5 times less than that of older people. In a situation like this, engagement of youth is getting more essential, while we can e easily be underrepresented if we do not actively contribute and work together. Next, please. The Voices of Your Japan, VYJ, is an online platform for young people to exchange thoughts and ideas and to empower each other. The VOIJ is run by about 50 university students in partnership with the UNICEF Tokyo office and the Japan Committee for UNICEF. Since its inception in 2019, more than 200 articles have been posted and have had more than 10,000 views. One of our key aims is to be a platform for every youth in Japan with ensuring access and inclusion of youth with various differences and backgrounds and trying to reach out to unheard voices. Next, please. From March till May, most of schools were closed and we were requested to stay home in Japan. Under the circumstance, BYJ had an online youth conference in May among more than 30 youth from various regions in Japan. We shared each other's situation, challenges, and positive changes, and discussed our expectation and action point for the future. In this event, we intentionally gathered youth who lived in remote areas away from Tokyo. It was because we believe the voices of youth from different regions and cultures, hence different situations, should be heard equally and shared among us. Next, please. The event was very useful in providing the opportunity to virtually meet others because there were not enough chances to communicate with others under the quarantine. In particular, since the new academic year starts in April in Japan, many first year students who entered the new school have not had an opportunity to enter the campus as yet and to make friends. In addition, Many university and graduate schools tend to be located in big cities and many young people live alone in an apartment far from their home and family. This event gave youth a platform to communicate, continue communications via the internet and to become friends. Having someone with whom we could talk about our anxiety and challenges was very meaningful in keeping our mental health and well-being especially in such a situation when in, where many of us needed to address unexpected fears and other issues by ourselves. The online event was originally organized since offline gatherings were not possible. However, those online initiative, we came to know that we could reach out to much more diverse youth audience beyond physical distance, and we could increase options to express ourselves verbally and visually with the help of some innovative online tools. It might be useful to note at the same time that participants and organizers perceive the online event as an additional option, not, not an alternative to an in-person event. In the process, we have intensively discussed how to respond to needs of youth who might have concerns and access to such online conference so that no one would have lost the chance to share their own ideas Access to computers and internet is an important priority, but just one of many aspects to look at. We need to pay attention to other issues too, not to create new marginalization through utilizing new technologies and developing new norms. For example, we need to promote accessibility and university design based on convention on the rights of persons with disabilities, privacy, and cultural and gender sensitivity, including perspectives of domestic or gender bias and violence, and others. We would like to make this event our first step 
to address these issues and letting you share devices safely and equally. This approach of taking differences for granted and promoting access to and inclusion of all use having our normal and routine procedure. And we believe it should be widely adopted in society in this war with the COVID-19 and after. Though differences might not be visible, we all are different. Our society has provided a, le a lot of levels on people related to gender, age, disability, nationality, or race. However, these are just one aspect of us, and they do not define who we are or what we do. Though my best friends and myself are both from the same city, men, and speak the same language, we like different sports, different cars, and we have different dreams. Stereotypic preconceptions based on levels are often incorrect. Regardless of levels or categories, we have in individually different strengths and needs. Since we are multifaceted, it is difficult to assume our strengths and needs from outside. Then, what should we do? We can simply ask each other our strengths and needs. Then we can address many of our social barriers and realize inclusion utilizing mutual strengths. Secondly, I believe it is important to always recognize that marginalization is not an outcome of a failure by those marginalized, but an outcome of social barriers, exclusion of others or their environment. Next, please. Based on this, the Empire Project, which we are running in Japan and other countries in collaboration, with various partners, including UN, is promoting coming out by supporters. And next to, to slide, please. Thank you. Whoever hopes to support others in, in the case with Magenta Star Batch, and whoever hopes to be supported can easily ask for support. Another person has his or her needs and strengths, and younger person has his or her strengths and needs. If we support each other based on differences, many challenges can be addressed. Next, please. Regardless of age, gender, disability, language, or ethnicity, many wear the magenta star badges and are supporting others. A variety of challenges are needs and needs exist. For example, many young athletes were robbed of chances to participate in key matches like a postpone. Tokyo 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games for which they had prepared for a long time. This can be a huge challenge and those athletes might need support from others. Likewise, most school events were canceled. Many of us are unable to meet friends and loved ones due to privacy concerns at home. They might not be able to even talk about such important topics with their peers. Though these issues might be directly related to poverty, higher mortality, or severe human rights violations, this can affect our emotional well-being, our way of life, and our future very much. All the youth include so-called ordinary youth who might not seem to need support at a glance are sometimes in serious challenges and needs for other people's support. Those needs arises not from categorization of people based on attribution, but from the specific context and needs of individual which always change over time. Next, please. If so, remarkable paradigm shifts are required. That is, first, a paradigm shift to sh see differences as value and strengths rather than threats. In short, we do not need to fear differences but should appreciate it. And secondary, a new paradigm to utilize emotional well-being as a key global monitoring indicator, in addition to traditional indices such as GDP, mortality, military power, and academic achievements. Next, please. According to our views that I elaborated, I want to outline my definition for the word better in the slogan of building back better. For me, the better world will allow everyone to pursue their own well-being in their own way, rather than being forced stereotypes or being compared with others. 
It doesn't cost much since it is the things that happen in our mind mostly, but has strong power to change the world. Not only all of us, but also everyone can do it right now. If how we see and pursue our lives can be changed, many aspects of our worries, including peace and security, sustainable development, and human rights can get better too. The power of each individual use is not small, and our collective power might be huge. We are the future, and all of us have a lot of possibilities. Believing in that, I would like to continue what we have started and call for your participation and collaboration. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for the excellent presentation on um, this very important topic. And um, as we are a bit um, tight on time, um, we will worry on expediting um, this uh, webinar a little bit. And so, without further ado, um, we will welcome Ms. Yano McKay, a former UNICEF trainee in Nepal, to the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, hello and namaste everyone uh, from Nepal. Uh, my name is Gyanu Bike. I'm a former trainee. Uh, I was a former trainee in UNICEF and before, before lockdown started, I was engaged with Rally International Nepal, where I used to work in a rural community of Nepal uh, for marginalized people. And our project was based on uh, healthy hygiene and water sanitation. But before, uh, after the lockdown was after the lockdown, we we had to return back to home, and our group of youths couldn't continue uh, our work due to lockdown. So uh, the, there was a direct impact of lockdown to youths' activities, who were already helping in a rural community to to give them uh, to to provide them good uh, services regarding uh, clean water and hygiene and sanitation. So as we are uh, today talking about the good practices regarding young people's action in COVID-19 response in the area of diversity and inclusion, uh, I would first like to uh, point out some uh, good practices that our youth from Nepal are currently doing, uh, uh, either it be uh, from their personal labor or from uh, like by engaging them uh, through any kind of NGO or INGO. So, uh, Next slide, please. Uh, so I have uh, I have just some uh, uh, I have just on the topic uh, how our youths from Nepal are uh, are doing their best uh, to to address the COVID nineteen response. So this one uh, NGO called Girls Empowered by Travel Nepal. It is an initiative aimed to empower girls around the world through travel and community service. And this organization is uh, basically uh, uh, women run. I mean, only girls are the member of this organization. So they very nicely uh, engaged in food relief distribution to the Musar family. It is a group of marginalized community who were badly affected by COVID-19 and fraud in Chandra Nagar municipality, Sarlahi district, which is a very uh, rural part of Nepal. Likewise, some local organization in Japa district, which is a district uh, where I originally belong, belong to, uh, with collaboration with Girls Empowered by Travel Nepal, distributed sanitary, sanitary paths to the women of various local areas in Japa district, Nepal, considering the importance of menstrual hygiene of women during this pandemic. As we know that uh, uh, since Nepal is a developing country, most of the women are not even uh, aware about what, what menstrual hygiene actually is. That's why this organization called Girls Empowered and the girls from this organization uh, were, were really nicely helping these women by distributing them pairs and by, by running the awareness session on why, why this uh, practice is good. Likewise, uh, uh, youths of Girls Empowered Travel also distributed nutritious foods to the pregnant women and new mothers of Sarlahi district, uh, which is also a rural part of Nepal. Next slide, please. 
So uh, here, here are some lessons learned regarding young people's action since COVID-19 response in the area of diversity and inclusion. The lessons we have learned regarding the young people's action in COVID-19 response uh, in the area of our diversity and inclusion are uh, like young people are, as we know that young people are sensible enough to support victims and marginalized group in COVID-19 response. As we know that uh, majority of the 90% uh, of the uh, youths make up the uh, population of the con developing countries. So it is, uh, and they are quite active and they, are, they have quite good potential to support victims and marginalized groups in COVID-19 response. They are the ones who have enough capacity to create post-COVID-19 world addressing the diversity and inclusion. In Nepal, youths are more dedicated towards supporting the most vulnerable and marginalized groups affected by pandemic. Having said that, young people's actions need to be more inclusive so that no one is left behind in COVID-19 response. They need to target their response towards persons with disabilities and LGBTQI. Next slide, please. So here I have uh, mentioned why, why, uh, what is the world to realize after the COVID-19 pandemic through our efforts, young people's efforts to build back better and make the world more inclusive. But through our efforts, through young people's efforts to build back better and more inclusive COVID-19 post world, the world uh, need to realize that young people's voice and actions are significant and they need to be given platform to share their voice and to perform actions. Through the engagement of youth, we can build back better fast. And young people have most potential to serve their community through various our awareness raising uh, events uh, about COVID-19. Further, uh, youth who are enthusiastic and highly motivated to bring change in community levels need support to conduct research. And for this research, they need, they need resources, they, they need uh, help from different international organizations, local organizations, and from also the government. The world is to realize that the participants, the participation of youth in COVID-19 response is necessary to make them realize that their involvement really matters to make a better post-COVID-19 world. Next slide, please. So uh, here are some actions required by young people and the international community to realize uh, why it is important. International communities can contribute by coordinating and collaborating with each other and providing each other economic and technical support. Young people around the world need to actively engage in bringing together creative ideas and innovations to create an inclusive post-COVID-19 world. International community needs to organize discussions with young leaders, change makers, to give them platform to share their views, ideas, and creativity to create solutions for coping with post-COVID-19 post-war. Likewise, young people need to come together and form a network to create jobs by engaging themselves in entrepreneurship, ensuring it is inclusive in nature. Next slide, next slide, please. So uh, in my final uh, slide, here are some action points and plans uh, that young people, including me, uh, uh, needs, to, uh, needs to focus on to make a better and peaceful post-COVID-19 world, which is, which is more inclusive. So majority of people who are marginalized due to their social status, uh, like me, are economically weak. Belonging to a low, ca low caste, I am desperate to serve poor people of my community by supporting them to, in to engage in entrepreneurship. For example, by engaging and motivating them in, in, in doing agriculture and, and training them on how to, how to, how to, how to make products more uh, in rapid way and how to sell them in market, even in post-COVID-19 world and to make money from this. Uh, I will educate and empower poor children of my community by providing them free quality education. Uh, as as uh, low caste, which is a uh, low status in our Nepal, uh, 
uh, people from low caste are quite economically poor and they don't have access to uh, quality education and they can't even afford to go to school, especially uh, I believe they, they won't be able to go to school in post COVID-19 world. So I, I, I really want, I really want to work for those kind of children of my community and uh, try my level best to provide them free, uh, free quality education. I will aware young people and children about the importance of good hygiene and sanitation practice. As we know in, in this uh, COVID-19 world, it's really important to be conscious about our good health and also our well-being. So it is very important for young people and children to, to know the importance of good hygiene and sanitation practice. I will also I will also want to empower women of my community by helping them to understand importance of menstrual hygiene so that they can make, take care of their body as well as mind. I will also want to motivate youth to realize their rights and speak up to get it. Especially in country like ours, youths, uh, youths, are, youths are left behind. They, they, there's not enough platform, uh, platform for them to share their opinions, views, and ideas. So I want to I want to motivate and encourage them to realize their rights and speak up to get it. Lastly, I will continue to empower youth by sharing and exchanging ideas for creating a community uh, with zero discrimination. Thank you so much. Uh, this is uh, this is really a great platform for me to share and represent Nepalese youth from Nepal and to share uh, my feelings and. Uh, and how how I want to engage myself to make a better post COVID nineteen world. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Kiana VK. Um, we have learned a lot from um, your speech and also from your valuable experience of doing your traineeship with UNICEF in Nepal. Um, thank you. We very highly appreciate it. And next, we have Mr. Timothy Mutabazi from the Uganda Christian University, who will be um, speaking. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Mr. Mutabazi, are you with us? Okay, well, as um, Mr. Mutavazi is at the moment not here, we will um, briefly advance and um, uh, to the end of our um, presentation. And um, with that, uh, we will go to the closing remarks. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Alex Mejia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Julia. Uh, please uh, nod if you can hear me. Um, I um, have two messages uh, before we close. The first one, of course, on behalf of UNITAR, the University of Tokyo, and all the organizers, is to thank all of you. I have been uh, privileged to hear this conversation, uh, especially the, the voices of youth. And, uh, and because I belong to the previous generation, I can tell you that the, uh, the wealth of ideas, the refresh view of what must be done is quite unique. And I um, always recognize that not all policymakers see that, and that is a pity. So today, this is a good opportunity for, to issue and to echo uh, for, from some of you so, uh, comments already, to issue a, a, ratific a, a reiteration of that call for governments to hear to what the younger generation has to say. Uh, after all, whatever we are doing today is for you, the young people in 10, 20 years to take over and to either enjoy or to live through sacrifice. And the way that we will wrap up the COVID uh, pandemic, the once a vaccine, God willing, is found, the once we go back to the new normal, that way in building back better, as we have been saying, will be critical because it will uh, determine how society itself will uh, operate, how 
the industry, the services, uh, the economy of countries will actually provide opportunities and employment for uh, people like you. So thank you for that. It's been a privilege for me to hear this. And because unfortunately we ran out of time and we went over time, um, we cannot have a Q&A, but we will uh, share this video and the presentations that Julia and her team uh, will be graciously doing so. So my second comment is simply to tell you that this is an ongoing process, that this has been uh, perhaps just the beginning of a conversation and there is still a lot more to say and a lot more to do to involve again policymakers. We at the United Nations and particularly at UNITA believe that capacity building should be done also from that perspective. It's not only training proper and teaching things and learning a new discipline or a new topic, but actually engaging in dialogue. So after dialogue, we have inputs, we have heard to the stakeholders and governments can actually do what they are supposed to do in creating a better world after COVID. With that, and unfortunately running out of time, as I said, as I just say, on behalf of UNITAR, on behalf of all the organizers, and particularly on behalf of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Ecuador and uh, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of UNITAR, I present to you my sincere appreciation and I wish you a good day. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.